Well, good morning and welcome at uh, this virtual bridge session on health and well-being and mental health. This is the first of two sessions. Scott Anderson, my colleagues, next week, uh, next Thursday, and I suppose we'll continue the theme and some of our discussions. Um, health and well-being, mental health, I suppose it's a title, isn't it? It's not about a framework, but it's about a culture and a context for delivery of that. It's about uh, building trustful relationships, it's about people, it's about building resilience, it's about listening, it's about caring, it's about acting, and it's about being inclusive for all our staff and learners. And I think I want to make that point that it is about the staff and the learners that we're talking about. What we want to look at today is promoting that practice as a vehicle for sharing and encouraging a professional dialogue around what is working well and perhaps what is not working so well. And when we're looking after the health and well-being of staff and learners during these unprecedented times, I think we all know that good mental health and health and well-being are critical elements of success for our learners and for our staff and supporting people to achieve their aspirations. Before COVID, if you can remember that far back, because it seems to have dominating our lives at the moment, I think we'd all witnessed an increase in the need for additional services around uh, in colleges, around mental health and well-being. And I think colleges in general had responded very well to that demand. Whilst this current situation is built on those experiences, there's no doubt that that need has changed. But personally, I don't think the narrative has changed that much. Both South Lanarkshire and City of Glasgow have kindly agreed to do short presentation about their own experiences. Again, I want to emphasize, this is not to set themselves above anyone else as doing any better than anybody else, but rather to hopefully um, stick some sort of professional discussion this morning and as I say next week with Scott. Glasgow, they recognised that the global pandemic had created unprecedented levels of change, uncertainty and a challenge to how they lived and worked. Their presentation will cover how their mental health action plan and staff strategic plans drove the implementation of strategies to address the change in needs of both staff and students and the context of delivery and for these to be sustainable for the future. And Kirsty and Jill have kindly agreed to present on that. For South Lanarkshire, their presentation will outline how the college strives to achieve equity and equality of opportunity for all learners and how the college culture supports them to achieve their goals and qualifications and Karen and Alison will present. At the hope we encourage you to engage in the discussions and to support each other going forward. Whilst the presentations have been undertaken, really I suppose for the purposes of the presentation, if you have any questions, if you could just pop them in the chat box down the side for now and then at the end we will have a full discussion. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the presentations. Over to Karen and Alison. Good morning, everyone. Can everybody, Barbara, can you let me know if people can hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, perfect. Good. So good morning and thank you for giving us the opportunity to, um, to share our experience with you today. Um, I'm Alison Chambers, the Associate Principal for the Faculty of Business at South Lanarkshire College, which is based in East Kilbride. And my co-presenter and colleague is Karen Phillips, who is the Deputy Head for the Faculty. Um, before uh, we begin our short presentation, I think I want to just reiterate the words that Barbara um, said in her introduction, that we don't have the answers. Um, all the answers to achieving equity for all our learners, which is the title of our presentation, which is striving to achieve equity for all our learners. And we're certainly not here to tell you how much better we do these things than, than any other college. I think we're all in this together. And um, at the very end, we've come up with some questions for Barbara to pose at the end of the session, um, maybe to help us find a way forward for the sector. One of those questions is around um, the reporting mechanisms that we have to use for uh, the funding council. 
So around the whole access and inclusion agenda, what we're trying to do is um, provide equality of opportunity. It's the whole um, widening access agenda. But still, we have to categorise students in order to um, present their, their achievement, their attainment at the end of the year. And there's something that doesn't sit well with me around all of that, but, but it's what we have. So be interested to hear um, the discussion around that towards the end. So if we could move to our first slide, please. Um, we're actually using stats from session academic session 1819 as the official 1920 stats have not yet been, been ratified. Um, and instead of us using our what we think our stats are going to be, um, we thought we would default to the ones that are already in the public in the public domain. So I'm just going to provide a little bit of background on our on our college. Uh, we're a small college. We have around 4,500 to 5,000 students per session across FE and HE provision. So we range from SCQF level two, which is our supported programmes, up to SCQF level nine and 10. We deliver year three of the Bachelor of Accounting for the University of the West of Scotland. And there are some PDAs being delivered in um, the Faculty of Care, which are at SCQF level 10. So our credit target sits around about 50,000 credits. Um, and to deliver that, we have three faculties. We have CARE, which is the biggest faculty, construction, and uh, our faculty, the Faculty of Business. Um, our students come from a mix of urban and rural communities. Um, and I'll, I'll just go through a little bit of the stats relating to some of those in, in a second. In our strategic framework, which runs from 2020 to 2025, like everybody's probably does, we have three um, priorities. And the first of those is successful students. And the first two elements under that heading are equality of opportunity and equity of outcomes. And I think because it's our first priority and those are the first two elements, I think that kind of signals the importance that we put on equality and equity across the college. Um, and Karen will come on to explain how we actually provide wraparound, the wraparound services that support the, the attainment that we have for our, for our students. Largely, there's no significant gap in attainment between learners from the most and the least deprived areas. So in 1819, our overall completed successful for the college was 80%, and that was up 4% on the previous session. Off the record, because it's not published yet, our 1920 um, stat looks better, better than that, which is a little bit odd because of the whole COVID, the whole COVID situation um, and how much more challenging it is really to support learners when we are teaching mainly remotely and our support for learning assistance and our ELS team are also delivering mainly remotely. So it's 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 been a bit of a challenge this last this last year as it will have been for everybody. We interview almost all of our students. Sometimes in evening class, we don't interview the students there, but mainly our um, full-time and part-time uh, daytime students are all interviewed. And I, I don't know if that makes it more possible for us to make sure that we have the right learners on the right courses from the very, very beginning. Uh, and there's always the exception to the rule. There's always a, a, a student who, you know, started in hospitality and after about four weeks decides they want to move to construction. So it's not it's not a foolproof method by any by any means. Um, of our student population, these are the statistics now, which is the, maybe the bit boring, but Karen's got the exciting bit coming later. 17% of our students come from SIMD 10 postcodes. Their attainment rate in 1819 was 75 percent, which is nine percent above the national average. Thirty percent of our students come from SIMD 20 postcodes and their attainment rate was 74 percent, which was eight percent above the national average. 
um, our under 18s, who we might expect to be the age group most at risk of withdrawing, they achieved at 73%, almost 10% above the national average. Um, I don't really want to labour KPIs any longer because we all have KPIs and we can all look at them relative to one another's across, across the sector. So the big question is how do we support our student population at South Lanarkshire College and strive to achieve equity for all our learners? So if we could have our next slide and I will hand you over to Karen. Thank you. Gosh, good morning, everyone. Uh, nice to, um, I was going to say nice to see you. That's usually what we say when we're all together in a meeting. However, it is nice to be here and thank you for asking us along. Um, as Alison says, we interview the majority of our students and this enables us, I, I feel, to get, to get to know them and their needs. And we're able to signpost them at that early stage um, to our um, learning development team, um, which includes um, extended learning support. And this function sits within in, in our faculty. We also have an online um, you know, e-portal e, e button in our stu student portal. So at any point they can actually get in touch with extended learning support or the learning development team themselves. What this allows us to do is it allows recommendations and support to be put in place as quickly as possible. And we do aim to do this as quickly as we can and prior to the start of the course, if that's at all possible. And that doesn't happen for everybody, but that's what we aim. That's what we really, really try to do is to get that support in place re as early as we can and to get the recommendations to the, the, the lecturers so that when the students start, they're not coming up against barriers or difficulties um, right from the start of their course. We set the scene at induction by highlighting the support to students available and every course and class group has a guidance tutor and all lecturers are well informed about the support mechanisms that can be accessed through our um, student services team. We operate on one campus, and as Alison says, we're not huge. So there are things that, that we can, you can do on one campus more easily than you can do in an enormous campus, perhaps, or a multi-campus organization. So it's, it's and whilst in pre-COVID days, you know, the journey, um, is a short one to take a student directly to the person that they need to talk to in student services. In COVID times, these support, support services um, are, have all shifted online as a lot of us had to do last March was to move a lot of things very quickly online. And we can now, we can easily uh, connect students with, still easily support, uh, connect them with the support that they need. The faculty teams have excellent relationships um, across the services. And we, we meet regularly in different groups across the college, be it from the senior leadership team to the college leadership team to the operational managers, curriculum managers team. We do a lot of collective work together so that we're sure that we're looking and making the best decisions that we can for our, for our students. As a college community, the students are very, very much at the centre of our focus in everything that we do and everything that we plan for. And we've got a real sense and strong sense of community and often have joint events that, that staff and students are, are involved in. And we've got a very, very active student association who, who supports these. So I'll give you an example. You know, there's Pink Day um, for breast cancer and prostate cancer. Um, there's Purple Day for LGBTIQA. Um, and there's things like, you know, Christmas, Christmas jumper days, just things that, that bring the community together. But there are also, you know, more serious, you know, things like volunteering and, you know, bringing organisations into the college so that, that the staff and the students can, can collectively feel, feel that strong, strong sense of community. The student voice is very, very strong through our class rep system and our student association. And we really do see ourselves as a listening organization. I was going to say um, there are prominent messages um, all in the public spaces throughout the building, but of course there's hardly anybody to read them at the moment. So um, what we have is a strong, a strong presence on, on social media, which reinforces our commitment um, to promoting equality and diversity. One of the, um, one of the other things that, that, that we, we did post COVID, but when COVID has, has, has kicked in, we do a lot more of, and that's resilience sessions. And these resilience sessions um, are for both for students and staff. So the, the counselling team at the college had developed the resilience session and we rolled it out to as many class groups as we could 
and we also use that um, at our staff development sessions. Groups and staff have been particularly um, have particularly welcomed this um, during during the COVID lockdown. The next thing that, that I'd like to just touch on is an initiative that came out of our own faculty, out of the Faculty of Business, and that's the Early Intervention Strategy. And the Early Intervention Strategy is we have an online, as, as most people do, um, attendance system where the students' um, attendance, they, they, they click in, and we know very, very, very quickly who's there at session and who isn't. Now, in the classroom situation, that would be somebody sitting in the classroom, putting it, put the attendance in, but the students swipe as they come in, so we can very quickly on a system see who's not there. So what we do is, while even while that session, that classroom session is happening, our faculty admin team um, will phone, contact the students, get in touch with them, and it's a different voice than, you know, maybe the lecturer or the guidance tutor, and it's someone who's saying, we notice you're not in class this morning. Is everything okay? Is there anything we can do to facilitate or to help you to be, be, be back here? And you know, sometimes they're there by the break time, they're there by the afternoon, and that just helps us to keep keep people on, on, on track. So we're just doing doing everything that we can do at that sort of early um, early intervention point. The other very strong um commitment that we've made in the colleges is to the counselling service and due to the increased um, counselling um, and, and helped by the additional resource that was made available to us by the funding council, we were actually able to increase the size of our, our counselling team from two to four. So we did, we had a counselling service before that money was put into the system for the counselling service and it was, it was well used, but we've been able to um, increase that offer. Students who access this feel well supported across the range of complex and challenging personal needs which they present with, and this enables them to um, be better prepared to participate and succeed on, on their courses. And this service has continued and has, has transferred online also, um, but this particular lockdown, we have minimum numbers um, that, that really, really feel that they need a face-to-face -face session come on campus that that can be facilitated currently. So um, Kenji, if you could move on to, to the next slide, um, which actually shows the infographic um, that was pulled together by Education Scotland following their discussions with us um, in the past, it just gives you, it gives you a chance to, to have a look around that. And I'm hoping that, um, that it, it just kind of gives a, gives a summary of what, what we're talking about. Um, as you cast your eye over it, can I draw your attention to the forever button um, on the bottom under number three? And the forever button was developed by our um, in-house um, systems developers. And this is accessed by the students on the student portal. The students can use this to self-declare, um, for example, if they were care experienced, carers, veterans, estranged, um, and what happens is that clicks directly through to a named person in student services who does contact them to offer support and guidance as they require. And that's not a one-stop shop, that guidance and support um, continues um, through, through their course. And they can also use the button to advise us of any change in status at any point throughout the year. This kind um, of support and named person service helps to keep students on track and achieving. So as Alison says, um, we don't have all the answers and um, we're just delighted to be part of this learning conversation. And we're hoping that um, after, you know, we've, we've heard, when we've heard from the city of Glasgow, that, you know, we'll continue to, to learn um, from the conversation and take that back to our college because it's all about um, reflection. It's all about um, making things better, better for our students. And we've posed a few questions on the next slide that we're hoping that maybe Barbara might, might refer to, to later on. But it's about, as Alison said, do we have the support in place that learners need to enable them to, to achieve their qualifications and goals? How can we better engage learners in self-declaring their needs and to access the available support? Because people still, we still feel that there are people that are a little reticent, you know, reticent about coming forward to say that they need help. And how can we better work together to influence decision makers to, um, you know, to, 
to recognise the changing pastoral needs of learners and how can we influence the recognition of learner need and how college per performance is, is measured. We've been in, in conversations, certainly academic boards, where um, you know, people are, will maybe say, ah, oh, but it's the students. But then what they do is they unpick these real difficult circumstances that people are, are facing these days. And you can understand that coming to college is a brave step, a difficult step. And actually continuing learning is there's a lot of barriers in people's way. And all we do is our best to try and reduce those barriers so that people achieve their qualifications and, um, and uh, achieve their goals, their life goals and their ambitions. So that's all that, that, that we want to see at this point. And I'll pass back to Barbara. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. That's great. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm just going to pass straight over to Kirsty and to Jill, please. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, good to be here today. As um, Barbara's explained, we're going to be kind of trying to focus. We're mindful that we've all probably been doing kind of similar things to try and, um, you know, respond to the needs of our staff and students. So we kind of wanted to focus on some of the sort of strategical um, drivers that's kind of influenced um, the delivery of our services through this time and also thinking about how they can be sustained longer term. Um, so I'm Kirsty McLeod, I'm the Mental Health and Wellbeing Coordinator um, which sits within student experience. My role is to coordinate the all the kind of mental health and wellbeing provision including counselling, um, the other sort of wellbeing activities uh, collaborating across the college and also I deliver um, holistic support myself, uh, particularly alongside long, uh, learning support and student advisors. Hi, so, I'm, I'm Jill Loftus. Thanks, Kirsty, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jill Loftus. I'm the, the wellbeing officer at City of Glasgow College, um, and I'm based within the HR team. However, um, I work cross-functionally across health and safety, OD, and the various um, areas within the college. My role, which is dedicated to staff wellbeing, is new to the college um, and was introduced in April last year. So right at the time when we'd gone into our first lockdown and people were working from home for the first time, um, not thinking that we'd still be here 10 months later. Um, I'm responsible for developing a programme of wellbeing activities for staff, engaging with colleagues to make sure that we've got a range of input um, into whatever it is that we need. Um, you'll all have felt it too. The, immediate wellbeing needs of both staff and students really became the forefront of everything that we've been doing um, and everything that we're faced with when we, we entered into what we now know was a, a global pandemic. Thanks, Jill. So just a, a wee bit of context. Um, as you know, we're, you know, we're based in the centre of Glasgow. So we've kind of been at the sort of highest restrictions and tiers kind of throughout um, the pandemic. We also have um, yeah, a lot of our students, um, we actually have 20,930 in total when we count our kind of community courses and distance learning. Um, but kind of full time, we have 10,643 students and a lot of those are home away students. So they're coming from all over Scotland and the UK, as well as um, quite a lot of our, particularly our nautical and STEM students that come um, from you know abroad inter, uh, international students so that's kind of posed its own challenges um you know similarly to um new Lanarkshire, year we have 20.3 of our students come from the most deprived areas of scotland um i guess part of being in such a central location uh we had the beginnings of some contingency planning because we were planning for the climate change conference that was planned for November 2020. Um, and so that kind of enabled us to have the sort of beginnings, I think, of, of kind of thinking around what resources we may need if the, the college had to close. Um, so let's think about the kind of next thing around, you know, the frameworks and, and things that have kind of influenced and uh, driven our delivery over the, um, last <clears throat> excuse me 10 months um and maybe some kind of points of, of, of difference with um some of the 
some of the other colleges. So we have the Glasgow Regional Outcome Agreement. So that's the framework that's agreed by the Glasgow Regional Board, which includes um, Clyde, Kelvin and ourselves to ensure that our um, strategies and, and kind of uh, goals are aligned with the, the regional economy um, and community um, policies. We have the access and inclusion strategy, uh, the student mental health agreement, which we've created alongside the student men, um, students association and our mental health action plan, which has been really um, central to helping us um, think about, you know, um, how we can kind of develop our, our services and respond to the changing needs of our staff and students particularly um, theme three, which focuses on kind of practical support and being um, offering a diverse and um, responsive kind of service to students. So that includes the counselling service. So for example, you know, we pivoted to a telephone service within two weeks um, of being in lockdown, but we also really looked at how we can um, you know, think about how we deliver that remotely and get information out to students and make it very visible that we are very much still there, which I'm sure is a an ongoing challenge for us all to um, ensure that students not only know that we exist, but, you know, how to access the support re remotely. Um, also, theme four kind of focuses around um, the how we kind of support staff to support students. So for example, um, we've refreshed our students, um, supporting students in distress guide, uh, which has also included some information around kind of checking in for um, well-being in a remote setting. Um, and again, it's been really important to kind of, you know, look at how we're getting that information out to staff, but also how um, that's, adapted to the the kind of situation that we um have been facing and continue to face so this would be a good time for me to bring in jill when we're talking about the the kind of staff and uh, student sort of interface thank you kirsty so yes um, we were initially in survival mode and in many ways we still are um, the journey sort of began with um consistently being with the, the well-being health and safety of our staff and students really been the key message throughout everything that we've done. We realised very quickly that there was a need to communicate um, with colleagues who were working from home. So, you know, like most people have done, introducing teams, quickly setting up a, a staff hub, hub, which was, you know, really has we've built on throughout the, the whole time to get some resources on there. It's been really important to us to keep those lines of communication open. And we wanted to make sure staff were supported um, and it quickly became apparent that providing physical resources as well was going to be really, you know, really a, a huge need at that time as well. And these continue. So providing equipment, um, you know, with over a thousand requests for desks, IT equipment, chairs. And now, the, you know, everyone is, is set up, everyone has kit to work from home. But the requests continue for, you know, now that we, we, we start to look at medical needs, when, you know, it's a prolonged period of time. So people have got different needs for the, some of the equipment that they're looking for. Um, although people have been very resourceful in setting up their home working environment. Um, we've continued as many of the wellbeing activities for staff, as you've mentioned as well, um, throughout the college, running them online. So things that people were used to doing while physically on the campus, just trying to get as many of those activities online as we could. So mindfulness programmes, yoga workshops, continuing with mental health workshops, um, our leadership and training academy um, continue to run programmes to help staff develop their online teaching methods. It really has been a huge learning curve for people and the impact of teaching in a completely new way, in a completely new way of working from home. It, we're really mindful of how that's affecting people um, and affecting their mental health as well. Um, a lot of the activity that we've done in the early stages and throughout has already was on our HR strategic plan, but in many cases um, have moved up the priority list. Um, so it needed to be implemented a lot faster than they might have done before. Uh, we introduced a home working guide, uh, which is now in place and it will be referred to for future. So a lot of what we've done, we've wanted to make sure it can be implemented and used, you know, as as for future so that they can learn from it. 
um, when we surveyed staff midway through last year, a lot of people said that they wanted to continue with the flexibility that they've enjoyed during this time. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there was guidelines in place through a guide so that they were able to do that. Although I think maybe by the end of this, the novelty of home working will potentially have worn off with most people. Um, our return to campus pre preparations as well. Um, so we had to think about the risk assessment processes, how we could you know, speed those up, you know, how, how to make that process faster. Um, when we, you know, going in and out of tears all the time, prevent, you know, pre presented different challenges. Um, and we introduced individual risk assessments as well, so that we could make sure that on an individual le le level, people with sort of personal conditions were being looked after and their number, number one priority was their safety if they were entering the campus at any time at all. Um, to future-proof those processes, um, we've made sure that the, any of the risk assessments that we've introduced are now built into our health and safety policy. Next slide, please, Kirsty. So as we prepare to pivot beyond the survival mode, um, which in many ways is still there, it's crucial that we, we plan for recovery. So we're thinking about um, recovering or returning to what was would be a mistake um, and would mean that we haven't really learned very much from this weird time. Excuse me. Instead, um, our plans, for our future are based on how we can reset rather than recover. Um, and as Kirsty talked about with our students, the staff, the impact on our staff's psychological well-being from this period of time is going to, you know, really need their significant and ongoing focus. We really just don't know what's ahead at all. We know that this period has highlighted a, a huge need for change. Um, and to reset from that is going to require us to sort of rethink, redesign, and in some cases, reinvent and remove certain systems and processes that have been in place that have maybe caused things to take an awful lot longer than you know, before and not always necessary. So really trying, to, when we see how quickly we can implement things, we can really learn from that um, and we can emerge from that and, and really flourish. And the last slide, please. So understanding the needs of our colleagues has been a huge part of my role um, and what needs to change is going to be really important um, going forward. So engaging with teams across the college to share their experiences um, is what is going to influence positive change. Engaging with student services, collaborating on joint initiatives um, allows us, you know, as student, as, as Kirsty mentioned, you know, to, to look at what we can do with staff to help our students, give staff the tools to make students have the best learning experience that we can give them. Um, to support this, we're going to be launching a staff survey through Robert with, in partnership with Robertson Cooper. Um, so they're specialists, um, you'll maybe be familiar with the name, um, in workplace health, wellbeing and engagement. And really the idea of that is to generate a baseline on wellbeing, which we can align our plans to um, create measures of impact and engage with people across the college on the action planning process so that what we are providing with the initiatives that we've got are what people are looking for. Meanwhile, we've got a programme of activities planned, um, such as digital wellbeing workshops, which are really needed just now to address this uh, immediate impact of how we're feeling when we're working almost 100% of our time online and in front of screens, which people are just not used to not used to doing. And you know, looking at the impact of that on our mental health, we're introducing energy MOTs and um, group programmes facilitated by CBT therapists to help. Um, some of our groups of staff that are maybe just finding themselves stuck um, and can't see a way forward. Um, and just the usual activities like mental health training, which will benefit both staff and students going forward. And back over to Kirsty to finish off. Thanks, Jill. So, yeah, so what's next for our students? Um, you know, as Jill said, you know, this is kind of given us even more impetus to kind of work collaboratively. And as highlighted, while we talk about kind of shared values and normalizing mental health as being something that staff and student experience, the pandemic has really highlighted to varying degrees that we are all impacted um, by that. So I think that provides a really good sort of jumping point to, to, to kind of um, think about how we can really embed those kind of shared values across the college, how we can continue to give choice and diversity um, of kind of delivery methods. So whether that's 
through kind of, you know, online counselling, telephone counselling. You know, we've developed um, more kind of preventative um, provision as well. So um, from the beginning of this academic year, we have been delivering stress management and now coping in COVID workshops in our guidance slots, which have been really um, well received. And, you know, as, as Jill said, kind of collaborating more around kind of staff training, um, you know, trying to think of different ways of being more visible as we're working remotely. You know, we've done things like staff newsletters from our team um, with, um, I don't know if any people would agree that it's a good thing but without you know photographs on and just little things like that that kind of maybe um help that kind of connection and, and, and visibility um i think also it's also about the kind of augmenting this this work that we've done around inclusive classroom teaching which again is um even more important you know working remotely or or is requires different thinking um, so we've been doing some work with the learning support around um, inclusive teaching around um, with students that have mental health needs and other additional support needs. So um, as Alison and, and Karen had, we had a, a wee question at the end as well, just around how we can sort of develop and um, improve our strategical plan so that our institutions can enhance the student and staff experience not just immediately at the moment and for however long this is going on, but kind of implementing sort of sustainable um, changes and improvements. So that's maybe something that Barbara can take us um, forward for us. Thank you for having us. So that's the end of the recorded part of this session. Thank you everybody for joining us and I hope you'll join us in future sessions.